again the duty and responsibility and privilege to preach the gospel lies upon the Reverend Martin. We'll just ask him now to come and bring God's word to our heart, please. Folks, if you have your Bible with you, we want to turn to the book of Proverbs. It's the book of Proverbs and it's the 27th chapter. It's just a single verse that I'd like to leave with you this evening. Proverbs chapter 27. And just as you're finding the place, I would like to add to the words of welcome that you have received. You're getting closer to this pulpit all the time. The front row literally is at the pulpit. You can here turn over my notes. I can just step back a wee bit. And uh, you're in what I I call the splash zone. (laughs) Because whenever a preacher gets liberty and he's not drinking water, then you can just see it all coming out. So I reckon the first two rows, I think the third row should be okay. But if I step back a bit, then my glasses and my notes and my Bible will get it all. Okay, so we don't want to... Dis- That's probably why Presbyterians all fill up from the back, you know. They don't like coming up to the front. But we just want to add to the very warm and kind words of welcome that you have received. I'm sure you've had that welcome at the door. Uh, and of course the Reverend Greer has made you welcome and other folks maybe beside you have done the same I'm sure if you're sitting beside someone in the meeting whenever they come and you don't know who they are they may be a stranger they could be a visitor from someone else somewhere else or someone has just come in and maybe they feel a little tense Uh, we never want a meeting to have any tension we certainly would want you to feel relaxed we wouldn't want you to feel uptight Uh, we feel you wouldn't benefit from the gospel if you're Uh, feeling tense so maybe someone comes in and they're a little unsettled and you're a member here or you attend here you may not know them maybe you could just at some stage whenever you're sitting in just have a little talk with them make them very welcome you don't have to interrogate them by the way where you're from why are you here do you know such and such well we have people in our church in Lisburn and we we call them individuals who like to welcome uh, both male and female And I see some of our folks actually from Lisburn here tonight as well, and we warmly welcome you. Uh, But uh, there are some individuals, and they would go around the congregation, and they would shake hands with them. They would make them really welcome. And uh, you would want to feel welcome when you come to a gospel meeting. Now, we wouldn't want this to be a cold house for you. We really mean that. So in case you weren't listening, in case you missed it, and you've been before and you weren't sure whether you were warmly welcomed. Well, let me just emphasize that. We're really glad to see you. I thought to myself, well, you see what a preacher does, he always does a post-mortem. He is an individual. He always does a post-mortem. We always do a post-mortem on our preaching. Whenever we finish, I drive home. I'm always thinking what I did wrong, what I should have done, shouldn't have done. And of course, we, we cut ourselves to pieces. And I thought to myself, I probably bored them to tears in the first week. I probably have preached too long and they'll start now to drift away. Well, I know the Lord has nailed that lie to the mass tonight and he has greatly encouraged my heart. But we are glad to see you and we do welcome you in the Savior's name. Now, don't let this be the first night and don't let this be the last night neither. I want you to come every night as best as you can. I know it's not always possible, but we want you to come back again. And because we would love to see you if you're not saved, we'd love to see you saved. And as I said before, we're not here to make you a free Presbyterian. And we're not here to proselyte and to take you from your church as such. But all we want to do, as every faithful ambassador of the cross would do, is to point you to the Savior, that you might come to know Christ as your own and personal Savior. And for those that are saved, we want you to pray for the meetings. Did you remember 12 noon? (laughs) I was going to ask for a show of hands, but thankfully I did. Some nights I couldn't ask you for a show of hands because I forgot myself. So that's the way it is, a senior moment. But I remembered today, and I've remembered most days, 12 noon. I know there are special prayer times uh, through the evening, morning times, and afternoons. But if we could all, and I thought about it today, there might be quite a number, Lord, just gathered with me. And even though we're far apart, yet we were together today at the throne of grace. And we were talking to the Lord about these meetings. And that's why I believe there's power in the prayer meeting. That's why people are coming and God's giving help because he's answering prayer. And you get out to the prayer meetings and I tell you, it'll do your soul good. I really mean that. And it's better felt than telt. That's the truth. You come and God will richly bless you. And wonderfully, he will answer your prayers. 
And uh, we trust you'll put feet to your prayers as well and hands and you'll bring people in. Maybe you say, well, I haven't asked anyone yet. Why not? We're into the second week. You need to get people in. And even if they don't come, at least do your duty. Clear your hands and uh, make sure you have no guilty conscience and you invite them and press the matter home. You say, well, it's a cold night. Well, I can tell you something. I saw them queuing up for certain places tonight, cinemas, shopping places, all queuing up on a freezing cold night. There's no excuse whatsoever. And sure, it's a warm building, and you've got a nice seat. And I think the heat is maybe off, but they tell us for every five individuals, it's the equivalent of a radiator being on. If you're somebody like me, you've probably two radiators in the pulpit already and a few radiators going around and not look around the congregation. But we, we do want to warmly welcome you and encourage you to pray and to support all of these meetings. Our thanks to uh, the Reverend Greer and Mr. Stewart for leading the meeting and we trust God will richly bless them as well. Proverbs chapter 27 then. And I just want to leave one single verse of scripture with you that the Lord has placed upon my heart in the verse 1 of Proverbs chapter 27. And there we read these words, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day will bring forth. Let's just bow briefly in prayer as we ask help of God in the ministry of his precious word. Father, we thank thee once again for a sense of the divine presence. And in a measure, we're adding prayer to prayer. We're just re-emphasizing that which we have sought thee and about today and talked it over. And we pray, Lord, for an intensified sense of the divine presence. We believe you are here, and we're sure of that. And we pray, O oh God, that not a single individual will leave this house tonight without knowing Jehovah Shema. The Lord is there. And Lord, we bid thee welcome, and we're glad the Lord has come. And Lord, we believe you've visited us tonight. You've been with us in the prayer meeting. You've been with us here in the praise and in the leading of this service. And as we have come now to preach the word that thou hast placed upon my heart, that word, Lord, that you brought to me, I ask, Lord, that thou wouldst give now a hearing ear in this congregation, a ready heart, a heart prepared by God, Pray, Lord, for male and female, young and old, that thou wilt single out, Lord, individuals, target them tonight in the gospel. We ask, O oh God, that sinners would be made to feel uncomfortable in their sin, that they will not leave this house in any way, thinking good of themselves, but realizing, O oh God, that they're sinners. And we pray that they will not leave until they get right with God. To this end, Almighty God, I ask thee for that which I desperately need, for I stand publicly and before thee as a candidate for the infilling of the spirit of the living God. I pray for utterance in the spirit. I pray, Lord, that thou wouldst give to me which you gave to thy disciples when you breathed upon them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. And Father, I ask now for that unction and anointing of the Spirit of the living God. I pray, Lord, for that infilling with wisdom and power, for the preaching of thy word, the rightly dividing of thy truth, the preaching of the everlasting gospel, the exaltation of our blessed Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. To this end, Father, I cry unto thee now for help by thy spirit and for power to preach thy word. And Father, in answer now to prayer, save the lost, restore the backslider, revive thy church, and Father, Glorify thy son, the people of God said. Amen. On Sunday night, October the 8th, 1871, D.L. Moody, uh, the great American evangelist, preached to the largest congregation that he had yet addressed in the city of Chicago. His text was Matthew 27 and the verse 22. For what, so I'm going to say, what shall a prophet a man? I preached in that recently. But what shall I do then with Jesus? which is called Christ. At the close of that meeting, he had this to say, and I quote, I wish you would take this text home with you and turn it over in your minds during the week. And next Sabbath, I want you to come and I will take you to Calvary 
and we will decide what to do with Jesus of Nazareth. The Shanky, who was the song leader on that gospel campaign, at the end of that meeting he began to sing with the congregation these words of an old hymn. Today the Savior calls for refuge fly. The storm of justice falls and death is nigh. The hymn was not finished. For while they were singing, there was the rush and the roar of fire engines outside that building. And they realized that on the streets outside, people were running for their lives. And the city of Chicago in the morning was in ashes. Moody to his dying day as an evangelist, he had this to say, I was full of regret that I had told a congregation to come next Lord's Day and to consider what they would do with Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He says, I have never since dared, he said, to give an audience a week to think about God's salvation. They may rise in the judgment, and I will never meet them this side of eternity, because many of that congregation perished in the fire that took the city of Chicago. He says, I will never meet those people until I meet them in another world. But I want to tell you, he said, the lesson that I learned that night, which I have never forgotten, and that is when I preach, I press Christ home to the hearts and minds of those who hear me. I bring them to a place of decision there and then, right on the spot. I would rather have this right hand of mine cut off than ever to give an audience one week to think about coming to Christ. And how true that is in Scripture, because that is, I believe, a scriptural principle. We should preach, and I intend to do that tonight, to preach for a verdict. That's what the old evangelists preached for. That's how they preached the gospel. They preached for a verdict. They didn't leave it with you to go home and mull it over. They didn't say, will you come back tomorrow night and let us think what you say or what you mean? And would you maybe think about Christ or consider Christ? Or you might come to Christ at some stage. They preached for a verdict on the spot. And I know some people may say, well, you can't buttonhole individuals. They may even say you can't put people under pressure like that. But I want to tell you something. When Moody preached that day and the roar of those fire engines and he gave them a week and he never saw any of those people again, he realized that the only time they could have gotten saved was on that night in that meeting and he let them go without challenging them and he gave them time without pressing Christ home and seeking a verdict and calling for a decision in the hearts of those who had heard D.L. Moody preach the gospel. Behold, Paul said, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And I will repeat this during my preaching. You need to get saved tonight. You cannot put it off until tomorrow. You cannot be sure because our text tells us, boast not thyself of tomorrow. Thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Paul reminds us today, three times over in the book of Hebrews, today, today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. We often sing in that great hymn in the gospel, be in time, be in time, while the voice of Jesus calls you, be in time. For if in sin you longer wait, you may find no open gate, your cry be just too late. Be in time. Don't miss Christ. Don't miss your opportunity. Don't boast of tomorrow. You're not sure what this very night will bring to you. You're not even sure you'll leave this meeting tonight. You're not even guaranteed you'll get home tonight. 
And some might say, that's scare tactics. That's the wrong way to preach the gospel. Well, how do we explain them when the Bible says, behold, now? How do you explain a text like this? Boast not of tomorrow. That's later on. The only breath you're guaranteed is now. The only opportunity you have is now. And in the light of that, I would even suggest to you, don't leave it until after this meeting. Don't say, I'll speak to the Reverend Greer or Mr. Stewart or one of the elders or the evangelist, and I'll get right after the meeting. I'm telling you now, just where you are, right now, you sort that matter right now. Should you never listen to me? Should you literally turn it down so that I'm not even shouting? You get that matter sorted now. You get right with God now. You turn your heart to Christ now. You seek the Lord now, right now. And I'm saying this to you. Tonight is the night that you need to be saved. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. Thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. And yet, sadly, men and women and young people, boys and girls, they trifle with their soul. And they leave off the essential, important matter of salvation. They imagine that God will always give them another opportunity. They assume that they will be here tomorrow night or they will get saved on the Lord's day coming or on the last night of the mission. Well, they may even think, sure, I can go home and I can get saved any time I want. There are individuals present here tonight and I'm sure there were times whenever you thought about getting saved and coming to the Lord, but you put it off. And even tonight you're sitting and you're saying, well, preacher, God didn't strike me down, you know, last night. And last week I was out at the mission and rejected the Lord, as you say, and went out through the doors and into the night. I'm back here again and God hasn't smitten me down. There's been no bolt of lightning, no peal of thunder. God hasn't roared his fiery anger against me. Well, I'll tell you why. Because he's long-suffering to usward. He's gracious. Fury is not in me, the Lord says. He hasn't come to destroy, but to save. And the long-suffering of God ought to lead you to repentance, bring you savingly to Christ, and you should thank God that he hasn't cut you off that he hasn't destroyed you, that he hasn't targeted you, that he hasn't removed you, and that you're still here tonight. And I'm telling you, this could be your final opportunity to get right with God and to be saved by his grace. I do not know, but this could be it, my friend. God's final call. Well, you'll never hear the voice of God again. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, Thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. How often we have preached on the Lord's day and by the Wednesday or the Thursday we're gathered again in our own church with a casket sitting in front of the pulpit. And I've often stood at those funerals knowing that I had preached on the Lord's day and there, and I'm thankful the majority have been saved individuals. And there's the family in the front row. And I think to myself on the Lord's Day evening, I wonder what family will be in the front row of my church. Could be my family. It could be my children. It could be your family. It could be you. It could be you. And what would we ever have to say about you? What could we say? Could we say you were saved? That you knew the Lord? Could we tell your grieving family that you're not mourning without hope because they're with the Lord, which is better by far when we don't know where you stood with God and you left no testimony behind. And we're not sure whether you had opportunity to call on the name of the Lord and to be saved. Our text, I believe, will further hasten you sinner to Christ and show you the folly of leaving spiritual things to the very last moment. Spiritual things 
too late. I want you to think as we look at this text tonight that there is the danger of arrogance. Look what it says there. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. There you, there's the picture. Can you imagine the man or the woman that's being thought of here? Who is the author thinking of? What man, what woman, what young person? He's obviously heard someone boasting about tomorrow. He's heard dozens of people in the royal court boasting about what they're going to do and what their plans are. Now, can you imagine the person that this proverb is addressed to? Here's an individual who thinks he has plenty of time and that he's got life all under his or her control. They have their plans. They're going to do this, that, and the other. They have their life laid out in full and they're going to enjoy life as it brings good to them. Perhaps someday they will get around to thinking about their soul. Perhaps someday they will think about God and about sin and about the need for righteousness before God and the need to get right in the light of the judgment of God and to seek Christ for salvation. But not today, not tonight, some other day. Boast not. Do you know how arrogant an individual is? Saying that I'll get saved some other day, some other time. You're not in control of your life. Your life, my friend, is not in your hands. And even if it was, you would also be needing to control everyone else around you. You would need to be in control of the young person that's flying at 70 or 80 miles an hour on a country road. You would need to be in control of the slippery surface on the road tonight to make sure your car does not go into the hedge or hit the tree. You most certainly would need to be in control that your body does not take cancer or that you're not stricken down with some virus whereby you cannot recall anything in your mind again. But you're not. And that's why the warning comes from God. There is the danger of arrogance. The scripture is full of people who lived and sadly died just like that. In the days of Noah, for instance, the Bible tells me they were living carelessly. They were eating, drinking, giving in marriage. Even though Noah, a preacher of righteousness for decades, he preached judgment. He preached the need to repent and get right with God. He was mocked. He was laughed at. And they just carried on their life as if it would never happen. It would never come. And then came the day when God shut Noah and his family into the ark. And then came the rain and flood and fury of divine judgment. When the entire earth, that's right, in the global flood, the entire earth was covered by water. And all outside the ark, a picture of Christ, were suddenly destroyed. They lived carelessly, boasting of tomorrow, as if life would go on without end. What about the rich farmer in Luke chapter 12? When the Bible tells me that he said to his soul foolishly, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Eat, drink, and take thine ease. And God said, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Or if we take the original Greek, and I'm no expert on it, believe me, I murder the English language rather than master the Greek. I learn from others. But they tell us, they shall require thy soul. The very demons of hell will come. You have the same reference in the Hebrew Bible. They're in the book of Job chapter 18. They shall drive thee from light into darkness. It's in the plural. And that very Luke 12 reminds us, they shall require thy soul. The inhabitants of the wicked dead. The same has happened to Belshazzar, king of Babylon, in the book of Isaiah chapter 14, when hell from beneath erupted in violent fury at the reception of that godless wretch, so hell demands your soul and could call for it tonight if God only willed it. 
And that's why, my friend, that foolish man, boasting of tomorrow, not thinking of today, his soul, God, and salvation. And here's a man who was a fool, the Bible says. I think of Felix. Whenever he was preached to by Paul, and Paul reasoned with him of righteousness, the need for a person to be right with God because his sin is an offense to God. For temperance, self-control with bodily appetites and with the sins of your life, and then judgment, judgment to come. And when he reasoned of those things, the Bible tells me Felix trembled. But here's his answer to it all. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. There is no record in scripture, nor in the history book, where, where this individual Felix was ever converted. The silence of scripture, I believe it implies that he was never saved. His convenient season never came. And I believe he perished even under the preaching of the greatest preacher apart from our Lord Jesus Christ, a sinner saved by grace, the Apostle Paul. And the same happened to Agrippa. And Agrippa was brought into a corner and he couldn't get away. And I'll tell you this, people tell us you shouldn't buttonhole people. Well, let me tell you, Paul did. And he did it under inspiration. And he took Agrippa into a corner and he says, Agrippa, believe us thou the prophets. Oh, we knew he did. I know you believe. And then he honed in on him and he pressed the matter home. And here's what Agrippa says, Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian, but not altogether. And so he dismissed him lightly with a healthy fear. There is no record that Agrippa was persuaded ever again to become a Christian. And you remember how it's worded. Almost persuaded to be. That word means to come into existence as a Christian. So you're not born a Christian. You must become one. You must be saved. There has to be a time in your life and mine. A definitive moment in your experience. A specific time when you're saved by God's sovereign grace. When you look by faith to Christ and that bleeding sacrifice and have peace with God. And I'm saying to you now that these individuals trembled, but they never trusted. And these individuals heard the gospel, but boasted of another time. There is no record in scripture that they were ever truly saved. And therefore, what about you? You say, well, I'm not like those individuals. Oh, yes, you are. And many times have you put it off? And many times have you rejected? And many times have you said, I know I need to be saved. You might be able to stand up tonight and surprise many people in this building and say, I know that I'm a sinner. And if I die now, I will perish in hell. I cannot save myself. And I believe that Jesus Christ alone can save my soul. I believe he's the son of God. I believe he came from heaven to earth and was virgin born. And he lived a sinlessly perfect life. He gave himself into the hands of cruel and wicked men. And after man had done their worst to his body, he was lifted up, suspended between heaven and earth. He's the mediator. He's the redeemer. He is the savior. I believe it all but you're not saved you're not saved the devil believes and trembles but you're not saved now why are you not saved why haven't you come why are you putting it off tell me why the last time you heard the gospel why did you say no answer the question if you say to me, well, I don't know why, well, find out why and answer the question honestly. And if you say there's no reason, preacher, then I say to you, come now, get saved tonight. If there's no reason why you shouldn't be saved, then get saved. Come to Christ tonight. Get the matter sorted. Why are you procrastinating? Why is there delay in your heart? 
Why is there reluctance to come to Christ? Why will you not repent? Why will you not turn? Why will you not believe? Why will you not come? Sinner, you're responsible to do it. God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So you're responsible for your own soul. And for your own sin, you're accountable. You need to do something about your soul tonight. Do something worthwhile. Something profitable and good. And that is come to Christ just as you are. Just you come tonight. And don't boast of another opportunity. But you settle the matter now. There is the danger of arrogance. I want you to think secondly. There is a declaration of ignorance. Look what it says here in the text. For thou knowest not. Man's ignorance, I believe, of the future is perhaps one of the greatest arguments presented in Holy Scripture why a person must get saved now. Thou knowest not. You don't know what's round the corner. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to come into your life. You don't know whether it's going to be good or bad. Let me tell you, and I confirm this with a person today, this actual story. I talked to them personally. They had dealings with this man. And I asked them the right way of it so I would bring it to you tonight. A certain individual was being witnessed to in the workplace by fellow believers or by believers. And that person not saved was listening. He came under conviction. And that man said to those believers that were witnessing to him in the workplace. He says, men, when I get Christmas over, I'll get saved. Thinking of the new year and a fresh start. When I get Christmas over, I'll get saved. He said that. He didn't deny the truth that he needed to be saved. He just put it off. That day he was prayed for. And I believe it's accurate to say his sister, that very day, pleaded with him to come to Christ. And he didn't. Now let me tell you the end of the story. He finished his work. He was looking forward to Christmas for whatever reason it was. It's the 21st of December. He took his car, drove around a corner, in a head-on collision with a lorry. He died in the ambulance. He may have had opportunity, we don't know. The person that told me this knows him extremely well, or knew him extremely well. And to this day, there's a lamentation and a deep-seated grief that he says, just give me Christmas and I'll get saved. The 21st of December, he was taken out into eternity and he was only a young man. Now, we will say this, he died in the ambulance, not at the scene. There may have been opportunity. He may have called upon the name of the Lord in those moments. We don't know a person's last end. We really don't. He could be with the Lord. And we, we would hope that to be the case. But we don't know. But all we remember are the words that he said. Give me to Christmas and I'll get saved. But you can't bargain with God. Therefore you need to get saved tonight. Death is the silent preacher you know. Why does death not touch you? Are you immortal? Will you live forever? Do you never think about your own day of death? And you don't know when it's going to come. The Bible reminds us of the brevity of life. It reminds us of the frailty of our existence upon this earth. It reminds us as well of the uncertainty of the day of one's death or even the Lord's coming. Could you imagine the Lord came back tonight? Where would your soul be? Where would your soul be? In heaven or in hell? Now, we're not into gimmicks. And if I tried gimmicks here, this would be the last meeting of the mission. But one man, he was preaching the gospel and he was preaching on the certainty of Christ's coming. And he was telling people in that meeting that they need to get right with God tonight. And he said this repeatedly, if Christ came, where would your soul be? If Christ came, where would you spend eternity? Kept repeating it. Then after he finished, he chose the hymn. 
And he says, we'll sing the hymn. I think it's 151 in our hymn book. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound. Up they got. The congregation sung the first verse right into the chorus, into the second verse. And then suddenly he just took his hand. I don't want to scare you here. And he banged the pulpit in the middle of the second verse. And he shouted, stop, stop. And the organist nearly had a fit. The whole congregation were standing with their mouths open wide. And the man that did this told me the story. He says he leaned over the pulpit and he was shaking. And he said to the congregation that day, Now you can be thankful, giving his name, that I stopped this gospel meeting and not the second coming of Christ. Because where would your soul have been? You may have even been saying, I'll get saved after the meeting, but it's too late. Do you see that? Do you understand that? I don't want you to leave this meeting tonight not knowing that. I don't want you to go out into eternity blind. I want you to see that you need to be saved tonight. You're not to boast yourself of tomorrow. You think that the shadow of death hangs over us all. But what of the suddenness of death? And then the separation of death. It will separate not only the man from his family and the woman from her business and her work and her children, but more importantly, it separates the soul from the body. And where would your soul be? Tell me. Right now, if you died, Christ came, where would your soul be? Heaven. Because you're born again, saved by grace, and you're trusting in Christ alone. Or hell, lost forevermore. Where would your soul be? My friend, don't boast of tomorrow. There's the danger of arrogance. And there most certainly is, I believe, a declaration of ignorance. Thou knowest not. You don't know what's going to happen, even in an hour's time. Therefore, you need to get right with God. And make sure it's well with your soul. And you have finally here in the text, I believe it's implied as opposed to written. You have the duty of diligence. Does it not make sense that if we're not to boast ourselves of tomorrow, if we're in ignorance as to what will happen, then it's implied the duty of diligence. Tonight you need to get right with God. I'm telling you that. I'll repeat it again. You need to get right with God tonight. In this meeting now, don't you let this meeting go. Don't you let this opportunity pass you by. You need to get right with God tonight. Don't you delay. And don't think for one moment because I'll tell you, there's death and there's danger in delay. I read on a numerous occasions I was traveling over to Canada. I will say to young people, by the way, and I may mention it in my testimony, that you pay for your sins. There's a price to pay. Very few countries outside of Europe that I personally can visit because of my past. Still there. It's a very high price to pay for sin, young people. You should remember that. I'm still paying the price. Some countries will not permit me anywhere near them. And there's some countries when I'm in that country, I'm not even allowed to fly a certain distance within the bordering country because of my sinful past. But I traveled to Canada, got a visa, got in. Three occasions. I went to Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls, I stood as close as that front row. I thought it'd be miles away. It's not it's right literally over the railings. You'd literally jump in, but I wouldn't. I did throw a Mars bar paper in, by the way. <laughs> and it went clean over, not me. The Mars bar wasn't in it, by the way, just the paper. It was in me. Both the Mars bar and I would have been over the falls. Not falls, you know, Niagara Falls. <laughs> But I want to say to you, the story goes that this beautiful eagle swooped down on the carcass of a lamb. The lamb was encased in a block of ice. Niagara Falls, I've seen the pictures and the videos, it literally can freeze over. But a huge block of ice was traveling along the rapids, coming along the Niagara River, heading toward the rapids and into the fall. Encased in that block of ice was the body of a lamb, that huge eagle. People could see it swoop down and was standing proud on that piece of ice, chipped away with its beak, 
took away all the ice and started to eat the body of that dead lamb. Every now and again, those who saw it said, lifted its head as if to say this wingspan will take me beyond the rabbits and beyond the fall and I'm safe. At any given time, I just need to stoop and flap my wings and I have the strength to rise and to soar at any time. Coming near the edge of those falls, that animal realized it's time to fly. Flapping its wings with its chest out, its talons were literally fastened to the fleece of that lamb, frozen stiff. And it squealed, and it yelled, and it flapped, and you could see the evident distress as the ice and the lamb and the eagle went down into a watery grave and into the darkness below. You see, friend, there's danger. And there's death and delay. Now don't put it off tonight. You get this matter sorted. Because I'm saying to you right now. That the voice of reason says get saved today. The voice of conscience says right away. And the voice of God's word says now. And the voice of scripture says today. What if tonight was the last night on earth. Or the last opportunity you would ever get to be saved. And you let it slip by. There is an interesting monument. It's a picture of a man. With a huge overcoat on. And he has long hair. It's definitely a man. And he's running. Beautiful statue. And he's running. And if you were to look at the statue. You would say that the artist. Has got it all wrong. Because his huge locks of hair. They're not. Going back with the wind as he's running. They're forward. That's an impossibility. It's against nature. Running at that speed as you see him go. With his locks in front of him. As opposed to behind him. And underneath his name is given. And the name. Is opportunity. If you don't grasp. The locks of opportunity as it passes you by. Then you'll miss it. It is possible. To miss heaven, you know. It's possible to miss being saved. It's possible for you to delay the matter and never find the Lord again. Therefore, we urge upon you and we are praying for you that you will come to Christ tonight. Whenever there is a promise of forgiveness in Christ held out to sinners, whenever there is a command to sinners to repent, and to turn and seek the Lord. Whenever there is blood. Whereby you can be forgiven. Where there is a sacrifice. Whereby you will be accepted. Whereby there is righteousness. So that you can be right with God. Then you need to come. And seek the Lord tonight. I'm telling you. Don't you leave this house. No matter about your work. No matter about your family. No matter about your business. No matter about how you will get home. Don't you worry about that. You sort it out tonight, friend. You get it settled tonight. And you need to come to Christ. For whenever the Spirit of God is working, then, sinner, you need to come. When the Spirit's calling, winning, wooing, and striving with you, and you have any concern, you need to strike when that iron is hot. I'm not a blacksmith, but I was down in the Folk Museum two or three weeks ago, Wife and I, I was only down for the soda bread, by the way. I went into the blacksmith shop and he had an audience, just my wife and I, and he gave me the whole rundown about horses and I'm a tiny, thinking to myself, I can need to get the place where they're baking this soda bread. And this place is killing me. But he gave me the history and as he took out that horseshoe and he lifted it out, I says to him, strike when the iron's hot. He says, that's right. That's exactly right. If it cools, you'll never bend it nor shape it. Well, sinner, listen to me. If you have any concern tonight, I'd love you to have heard the prayers of God's people tonight. That's exactly what they prayed. If you have any concern tonight, the Reverend Greer, Mr. Stewart, Thomas Martin, or any other Christian in this building did not put that concern there. God did. 
If you have any trouble, anxiety in your mind about your soul and your need to get right with God, I'm telling you, Spirit of God has done that. And when the Spirit's striving, you need to come to Christ. For if he stops, then you'll, co you'll get cool. Then you'll get hardened. And you'll never be moved to Christ again. I'm telling you. You cannot be saved apart from the Spirit of God. And if he stops striving, you're finished. We could pray all night. We could fast all week. We could evangelize your soul as best we could. We could preach to you, even in your own house, and read the scripture. But you'll never come to Christ. You've missed it. I don't miss it. You see, friend, I'm going to tell you something. How often it's true, and I've always thought about this when I'm at a gospel mission. I know in the natural realm there comes the last Sunday evening and the caretaker just takes the switch and he knocks the light out. And I've often thought of that moment and I've been present when those lights have gone out. And I've thought to myself, Lord, how many lights of opportunity now that we're brightly lit in the mission have gone out for lost souls. This could be the mission for you. In fact, I believe it is. And you need to avail yourself now of this opportunity in the gospel and come to Christ. We're loath to let you go tonight, young person, older person, because we want you to be saved. We love you in the Lord. There is no merit for me. I will not get into heaven because you were saved tonight. I will not be any better or any more righteous or holy or just in God's sight because you came to Christ tonight. I'm telling you, no brownie points for me. I'm not getting to heaven through preaching. We just want you with us. What I have, what others have, we want you to have that. Now what's wrong with that? Why are we monsters? We're not. We're sinners saved by grace. Listen to me. I'm fit firewood for hell. I should have been there. I know I should. And I could take you to places in Lurgan and nights when I should have been in God's hell. But he saved me. He can do it for you. He can save you tonight. But friend, listen to me. Listen to me. Don't go away without Christ. Come. It's time you were saved. It's time you got right with God. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. For thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. May God, I pray, by his spirit, back home, burn in, bless this word savingly to your soul and bring you personally to Christ. Let's bow briefly in prayer. <laughs> Our service is over. We're going to let you go. But we're thankful that you've come tonight and we really mean that. And can we just press once more, just the once more, if you'll allow us to do that, the point home to your conscience. If you need help tonight, how to get saved, I'm telling you, we're here to help you. We can't save you. We can't save you. But we can point you tonight to Christ. We can help you to come to Christ. We can show you how you can be saved. We know how to get saved because we've been saved ourselves. And the way we have come, you'll come. No difference. But don't go away without the Lord tonight. You just speak to us at the door. Just make mention to a Christian friend. Just sit where you are after the meeting's over. Just say to a friend maybe you're with or you know, I'd like to get saved tonight, but just keep it quiet. And would you tell the minister or the evangelist or Mr. Gray or any other person, I would like to get saved tonight. I want to sort it out tonight. Just you tell, tell someone beside you, or even at the door, you just say to any one of us, I need to talk to you. Well, right away, right away, we'll move and we'll bring you into the inquiry room. Now, we'll not be broadcasting it. We will not be parading you in front of anybody. The most important thing is that you're saved tonight. And you can be. Will you come? Will you trust the Lord tonight? May the Lord, by his mercy, grace, and spirit bring you savingly to Christ. Let us all pray. Father, we do thank thee for thy word. Lord, we think of the urgency there is in the gospel. We pray, O God, that you will put that urgency in the heart of the sinner. They may realize that this is the time. 
It's time I was saved. Too long have I resisted and rejected. I've sat in my sin for far too long. Tonight is the night that I'm coming to Christ. Give them help, Lord. Give them deciding grace. Make them willing to repent and believe. Turn their heart to the cross. Help them to look by faith to Christ alone, who alone can save. Lord, part thy people in thy fear and favor. May we leave this house tonight prayerfully and very, very carefully. But those who are lost, even those who are unsure, even those who are backslidden, may they wait behind tonight. May they turn and seek the Lord. Father, hear and answer prayer because we ask it in Jesus' precious and worthy name. And the people of God said, Amen.